This is episode number 248 with Guido Frick. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plain Air Podcast. My guest today, we'll get to in just a minute, Guido Frick. Some say Guido, if you're on the Italian side of the border. Uh, Guido Frick is a brilliant artist and a student of the great Sergei Bonkart. We're going to talk about that, so hang in there for that. Uh, we are really, really excited. You know, life seems to be resuming after all that time, and uh, I, I'm getting ready to travel a little bit more again. I, I was traveling uh, too much, quite frankly. I was traveling. I was out uh, business-wise and otherwise about 40 weeks a year, not all week, all four, about 40 trips a year. And uh, at COVID time, it's like, wow, I reconnected with my family, and I actually like them, and they actually like me. And so uh, I'm trying to travel less, quite frankly. But, uh, you know, I'm itching to get out to certain places. And so we do an annual uh, thing every year. I, I do an annual plein air painters trip every year, usually somewhere exotic. Uh, last September, we went to New Zealand. And uh, I'm about to announce a new one for next year. But in the meantime, I also do an annual art collectors or art aficionado trip for Fine Art Connoisseur magazine. And uh, we just announced that we're going to uh, uh, Spain and uh, Sweden. And we picked two specific cities because they're rich with art. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of experiences we can create. And so we're going to start out in uh, Stockholm. And then uh, we're going to spend a few days there. And then we're going to get on an airplane together. And we're going to go to Madrid, spend a few days there. It's uh, it's going to be a brilliant trip. Our trips are, uh, excuse me for sounding um, uh, braggadocious, I guess would be the word, and that is that our trips are legendary. Peter Trippi, our editor at Fine Art Connoisseur, just puts together amazing things. Uh, we have travel partners who do incredible experiences, and we have had experiences where uh, they're just not duplicatable anywhere, anytime. You know, like we had a private entry into Alphonse Mucha's private family home to see his private collection only because of our connections. Uh, nobody ever gets that. And um, we had to swear we wouldn't take photographs. We uh, we got into the Sistine Chapel privately. That doesn't happen with the lights on. And that never happens. And uh, so we I actually did the first Facebook Live ever in the Sistine Chapel. So anyway, that's coming up. Uh, we're going to be doing that in October, and you can learn more about it at finearttrip.com. This is a big, big week, the big week, as a matter of fact, because in just a couple of days, uh, a big bird is going to land in Denver, Colorado, and I'll be getting off that with my family. Uh, they come to help me work at the 10th Annual Plein Air Convention. 10 years, hard to believe. Uh, this convention is kind of like homecoming for Plein Air artists. It's like we all understand each other. We love what we do. We all talk, you know, we sit around and we talk about cadmium colors or, or uh, mediums or, you know, or easels or whatever. And, you know, our family, when we talk about those things, that they don't relate. You probably have experienced that. So uh, anyway, we also are going to be learning from the world's great masters. Uh, we have five stages, watercolor, oil, pastel, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we have a big expo hall of art materials. There's no place in the world that you can go and find all the plein air stuff. Because the art stores don't carry most of that stuff. You're going to see a lot of other stuff too. 
But um, anyway, and then we watch these people on stage. We learn every day. It's a five-day event. We go painting every day uh, to cap off the day and capture what we learned, practice what we learned. So uh, I'm packing my gear. I'm almost ready to go. Can't wait to get there and see my friends. That's the best part about it, quite frankly, is you make a lot of friends. You see them. I've made a lot of friends there. So uh, anyway, that's the plein air convention. You can still get a ticket. Uh, well, I think you can anyway. Um, anyway, check it out. If you're within a two-day drive of Denver, which is like Indianapolis or Minneapolis or you know anywhere, you can still get there, and it's a phenomenal experience. If you live close to Denver, you know, three, four, five, six, eight hours away, don't pass it up because we're not going to be that close again, maybe ever again. Uh, you never know. So, um, but we're not not planning to go back to Denver. We already know where we're going for the next two or three years at least, and so uh, you don't want to miss out on that. So come to plenairconvention.com, find out. Uh, coming up after the interview, I'm going to do the Art Marketing Minute. We're going to talk about getting ready to launch as an artist, launch your marketing, and also overcoming price objections. We, of course, want to thank Feedspot for making this the number one podcast two years in a row in their Feedspot Art Marketing Art, not art marketing, number one in art podcast list, okay? And uh, by the way, if you can't make it to the convention, we have a virtual option. The main stage is going to be streamed. You can sign up for that. It's less money. Of course, you don't get all the perks of being at the convention, but if you can't go, you can't go. And so this is a way to watch it. You can get replays and uh, if you can't make the date. So it's a good good option for you. Just it's all at plenairconvention.com. Uh, and then last but not least, it's getting to be busy season, right? So summer's coming. Uh, I always do the spring retreat in the Adirondacks. It's sold out. Um, we did manage to get a couple more rooms. And so we've got a couple slots if you want to go. Uh, just look it up and, uh, and sign up. But we have a lot of rooms left for our fall retreat this year in the Adirondacks only this year. Uh, which is at a different place and a really spectacular place. And uh, it's going to be selling out soon. We're over half sold already. That's coming up in, in October. Uh, so you can do either or both or all. Uh, just check it out at publishersinvitational.com. By the way, I should mention there's no invitation required. Okay, now this is a red letter day. Uh, we actually have never met, but um, today is the first. I have Ido Frick. Guido, your name is spelled like Guido. What's the deal? <laughs> well, the deal is north of the Alps, they say Guido. And south of the Alps, Italy area, they say Guido. You know, it's okay. more so if you're in the Italian Alps, Alps, you're Guido, which means you're a member of the mafia. But if you're in the wow. northern Alps, you're you're not a member of the mafia. It's Guido. It's Guido. And then I hear the so Sazon speaking my name in Italy. I think I hear Pavarotti singing, you know, Guido. You know, so it's kind of funny. Anyway. And are you, um, are, are you Swiss? No, I'm German, you know. You're German. Yeah. I'm so German. you would be from like the southern Germany, parts of southern Germany? I live right on the Swiss-German border area. Okay, so, so I, down by Neuschwanstein in that area? I crossed from Germany into Switzerland in 30 seconds. Just yes. walk over the street and I'm in Switzerland. One step. Okay. Terrific. So uh, you have become quite well known as a plein air painter. And I'm very curious to, we're going to learn about your career. Um, so, and, and we also are going to talk a lot about your time with Sergei Bongart, who is legendary. And, and you were one of the privileged who got to study with him. We're going to learn about that. We're going to talk about some of his theories and some of the theories that you have as a result of that and what you've learned. So let's, let's dig right in. How did you, um, you, you grew up in Germany. I don't know much about the art scene in Germany, except I know there were some very good schools in Dusseldorf, um, and, and perhaps in Munich. Uh, but how did you end up as an artist? It's uh, in Munich and in Düsseldorf, we have some traditional schools, you know, academies. Yeah. And I was uh, on a little academy in my hometown that time. We had a great teacher. It was a professor from Czechoslovakia. He was a fantastic colorist. And I mean, you know, probably, Eric, all these guys from Eastern Europe, they, uh, they have a color sense, which is tremendous, you know. If it's 
it's Russian, if it's Ukrainian, if they are from Armenian, from Azerbaijan, from Kazakhstan, from Baluchistan, whatever stand they are from, you know, they just have a great sense for, for color. And, and why so, do you think that is? Is it because of the Russian influence? I think so. I think it's somehow in their genes. You know, they see colors just stronger than we see that. If I try yeah. to exaggerate color a little bit, they make it much, much more right away. And it perfectly fits in their painting. It's unbelievable. I have a friend in, in, in uh, Oregon. He's 90 years old, but you should see his color sense he has. It's, it's tremendous. His name is yeah. Sarkis, Sarkis Antikaya, and he's an Armenian. And he's fantastic in colors too, you know. So I know well, several. I've spent ones. a lot of time in Russia, and and I had seen uh, books on Russian paintings, yeah. but there's no comparison. You know, the the thing that that I love are the the figures that are done outdoors, and the the sense of light hitting those figures is just absolutely brilliant. And That's right. you're right, the colors, you know, you, they get that glowing sunshine on your face, yeah. and the the yeah. glowing colors in the clothing, and the it's, it's just pretty amazing to me. And, um, I, you know, I don't know how they do it either. I wish I did, but you probably have a better sense of that, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So well, you went to art school in your village and then what happened? What happened was I was the speaker of the group, you know, and, uh, someone, I was studying with this guy for about four years. And once in a while towards the end of my uh, time with him, he came and asked me and said, Guido, shouldn't we have women in our class? I said, Professor, no, we don't want to have a woman. So <laughs> a few weeks later, he came again. Shouldn't we have women in class? I said, no, we don't want to have a woman. And You're then a, lot of grief for this, you know. a little bit later, he came with a woman. And this woman was a beauty. And it happened exactly what I expected and why I did not like to have a woman in our class. She was a beauty. And from first day on, when she was in school, he was dancing around her skirt 24 hours a day. And we did not get, we didn't get almost any more uh, instruction from him. And she could do a show after six months already. We have been told you cannot do a show before you have studied with me three or four years. So I went to her show in the neighbor's city and I saw that 90% of the painting he did for her, including the signature. And I told my girlfriend that time, I said, Look at this horny old bastard. He painted all the stuff for her. And the waitress ears get bigger and bigger. And she listened to my nasty comments, you know, and she told that to the professor. The next day we had a open a, a plein air meeting on a field in Switzerland. It was a potato field and he was circling around me like a hungry tiger. And so suddenly he came and said, Guido, you are fired. Get your stuff and leave school. So I put down my French box and took it like a luggage and left the Swiss potato field. And this was the end of my academical career, you know. <laughs> but that time I still knew, I still knew that I'm not that far as a painter where I want to be. And happily, I had already several years uh, visited the United States. And on one of these occasions, I subscribed it at one of these uh, famous magazines. And I opened it up and I saw on the second page a painting from a guy named Sergei Bongard. I never have heard about him. And I saw this, this picture, this illustration, and I was thrilled, you know, right away. And I knew this guy has somehow to become my next teacher. So in the major article about him, I read that he is doing workshops in Idaho and that he has a, a little academy or something in Santa Monica. So two months later, I already came to him and got taught by him. And so I knew him then. I was with him somehow for the next two years. The funny thing was, I think he was a little bit flattered somehow, you know, that somebody from Europe came over to get taught by him, going through all the obstacles to fly from Europe to the United States, hardly speaking English, renting car and uh, spending lots of money, spending time, etc. So I was several times invited after the workshops for a farewell dinner in one of these uh, steakhouses in Idaho Falls. And the first time I was sitting opposite of him and I was scared to death because my English was so lousy. And I hope, I hope he doesn't talk to me because I wouldn't even know what I should answer. I probably <laughs> wouldn't understand what he says, you know? So, but I understood that I should already stake what I did. And this very first uh, time with him at this uh, farewell dinner, 
I tried to ram my fork into the steak and I was so shaky, the steak fall, made a jump and fall down on the ground, you know. <laughs> it was big embarrassment and I was red like a tomato, but Sergey, he said, well, not a big deal, we're going to take that for the doggy bag and you get another one, you know. So I had this funny start with him, but I had a sad ending with him. And that was two years later in 1985, end of February, it was 27th of February, when I got the day before a phone call from his wife, Pat, who was a painter too, by the way. He married her just a few months before he died. And she told me, she said, Guido, if you want to see Sergey one more time again, you need to hurry up. I said, why? She said, well, he's very sick and we are in Switzerland, high in the mountains in a hospital uh, near Geneva. And uh, we tried to give him a cell therapy because he had le leukemia, something like that, you know. So next day I drove down and she told me then when I entered the hospital, she said, when you go in his room, do not show any reaction. He looks really lousy, you know. So I went into his room and what I saw, it was half the man I had seen a few months before in Idaho. He was skinny, he was fragile, he was weak. He was sitting in his bed, stabilized by several pillows so that he could sit upright, you know. He hardly had the energy or the power to raise his hand to say hi Guido to me with a whispering voice. And uh, I was with him then for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And I saw it's time to go because he's getting weaker and weaker. And uh, I said, Sergey, I have one more question before I left. I have one more question. And uh, I said, what should I do? Should I stay with my journalism job, which uh, guarantees me every month a very good income and a very interesting job because I was writing about soccer world championship, about Olympic Games in Munich. I was writing about Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali in Europe, you know. So I had some really great events I could write about. It was an interesting job, but uh, I was insecure what I should do. And I was asking him, what should I do? Should I quit that and should go for a... Uh, a professional painter or a full-time painter and he said something to me which i appreciate more than any of these rosettas you can get at art competition you know which i always think makes you look like a prize pool on a county fair so um, <laughs> he said to me he said to me guido you are very talented you should go for a professional painter so from that day on i was working for that so sergey was a few one one week later I was there 27th of, of February and on 3rd of March, 1985, he died, you know, and this was very sad for many, many, many students, famous ones, less famous ones, hundreds of students throughout the United States, even a few very famous guys from Hollywood, like Gene Hackman, if you remember him. I just recently saw pictures of him. He's still alive, 93 years old and lives in Santa Fe, and he has a I'm, I'm still student. waiting for Gene to send me an invitation to paint with him. Yeah, yeah. I think he's a, <laughs> he was a good, he was a good, I mean, I haven't met him personally. He was a year before I was with Bonga, but he, I saw paintings of him because he's published somewhere in a book with his stuff. And yeah. he was a pretty good painter, you know. Yeah. So Bonga was gone and uh, I tried to follow up his instructions and that's what I still do today. And when I'm painting, you know, it happens that I have his voice in my ears. I don't have the voice of my first professor in my ears, the one yeah. who kicked me out of the potato field. You know? Yeah, well, he ended up marrying that woman, and then uh, he didn't get another show. <laughs> so, so uh, Guido, you um, you studied with, with Sergei for, what would you say, two years? Two years, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I jumped and, over the States on and on, you know. I was yeah. pretty lucky because... My sister that time, she was a German flight attendant at the German Lufthansa. So I could afford to uh, financially wow. to come over pretty often. And I yeah. came over six six times a year to meet Sergey and to get instructions from him, you know. So that was very helpful. But no, uh, I, I understand that <clears throat> while we're, we'll talk about Sergey and then we'll continue on with your career. But um I understand from talking to others who studied with him that he was very tough um, and that it was it was very tense at some times when he was was critiquing you. Is that true or is that not true? 
Yeah, he could be uh, pretty tough, you know. And uh, first of all, what he didn't like was when uh, he did a demonstration and people made noise a little bit talking in, the, in one of these many uh, uh, yeah. uh, rows of people they have behind him watching him, you know. It was kind of funny. He had a, a big barn in Idaho. And uh, in front of the barn, there was his setup, his still life, and, and his easel ready, etc. And then he came in from the back door and walked through the whole barn towards the front where his stuff was ready for painting. And he was holding a bundle of brushes like a, like a candle, you know. Uh -huh. And behind him was one of his sh sh short, uh, he had small guys uh, as assistant. So one was a Chinese guy and the other one was an American. The Chinese guy was a famous painter, actually, signing up in Japan. And the other one was Ron Lucas, both are great painters too, assistant of Sergei for several years. And they came, the one came with a, with a pellet in, in his hand, walking behind the master. The other one came with all the liquid stuff, etc., walking behind the master. So it was a kind of funny parade which came in and the audience already started to laugh about that, you know. But uh, Sergei was a kind of natural authority, I would say. When he came, he was room filling somehow, you know, the, the attention went right away to him because he had this kind of aura, this kind of uh, uh, interesting Present, personality yeah. that he draws attention right away. So you automatically took a little bit care because you had the feeling, well, with this guy, you need to be somehow a little bit more respectful. And so he got lots of respect, but not from everybody. And sometimes people just annoyed him by talking too much and whatever, you know. So if somebody was coming with stupid questions or so, he could be rude. He didn't like that. He didn't like stupid questions. And he also didn't well, like... How do you it. know your question is stupid or not? Pardon? How do you know if your question is stupid? Yeah, that's a good question. But he was annoyed, you know, when he had explained several things on and on and on. And somebody still did not understand what he was talking about. Then he said, "Well, why are you talk? Why are you asking me that again? I just told you that. Didn't you forget? Or did you forget or whatever?" So sometimes then, if a lady or whoever that was, you know, uh, didn't paint really the way he could accept it, he could be pretty tough in his statement to tell her that she better might go for another hobby or something. But usually he did not do that in public, you know. He talked then more in the eye to eye to her, not to embarrass her too much. But it happened, I haven't seen that at all the time, but I was told that two or three times he was really very almost loud and, 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 and the lady, uh, the student broke out in tears because of the critique he had for her. You know? So I understand that um, uh, my... I believe this is true. I may be completely wrong about this, but I think there are kind of two known colorist schools or colorist movements in America. One came from Hawthorne, Henchy, right. you know, through their students, yeah. you know, Camille Preswadek, for instance, is one of them, uh, one of many. And then there's the Bonkart school, which I think wasn't that rooted in fashion. I would say, uh, I mean, Bongard was um, uh, trained by one of the students of Ilya Repin, and Repin was is a, is a, the, the the big boss of the Russian art, you know, still today. Still is. He still is, art. even though he's gone. Yeah. And, so uh, I was over was, in Russia uh, back uh, in March, right before COVID, yeah. and uh, I met uh, this delightful little man, and little man meaning like four, four or five or something. And, and um, we spoke, we had a translator. Yeah. And uh, I, I found out that he had been the director of the, the great Russian art museum in, um, in uh, St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what was going on, but there was this massive Repin show, the largest Repin show in history. Yeah. And I, I inquired about it and I couldn't, couldn't get in. It was sold out. So I just happened to meet this man. He says, oh, I'll get you in. And he he writes a little note on the back of his business card and says, hand this to them when you get to the door. I didn't think it would work. It was for me and my translator. And I, I got in. I got to see that show. I, I think it was the last day. I was able to get the books. But, the, you know, Repin is, 
the master of all masters in Russia. And, and really, you know, he's at the level of Sergeant Zorn, Soroya, and, totally. but, but he approached things differently. Definitely more, more colorful. Very influential, you know, but on the other end, what you, what you surely know is uh, what I always say, a Bongard method is actually not existing, you know, what Bongard did, he came over to United States end of the forties of the last century. By the way, he started in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. He married uh, Miss Tennessee that time. She died a few years later in a car accident. And so he went to California because he, by emotional reason, he didn't like to stay in Tennessee any, any longer. But uh, what he did, he brought over Eastern European academical training. That's yeah. what he was teaching here, you know? And today they say it's Bongard method. I mean, he was trained academical and that's what he passed on when he came over here to the United States. So we know? think of him as a colorist, but he was really putting you through the same training that you would get at the Serkov or the, or the Repin Academy. Um, Absol absolutely. Russia. You know, yeah. absolutely. He was, uh, there's a, one of his students, one of his uh, assistants one day said the teaching of Sergei fits on one piece of paper shield, you know, that's what, that's all, all, all what, what it is. And you need to follow a few, he, he never said formula, he said rules. You follow yeah. rules, consequently, strictly follow these rules, and it will lead you to end up with good paintings. All right, we need to know what those rules are. <laughs> I tell that in my workshops, Eric, you know. Maybe one day we do a DVD and then I, you will see what I mean. But I will <laughs> tell you, it's, it's a simple thing. You need to take care for color, for temperature, and for value. But how do you need to take care? You need to analyze your subject, you know, before you grab a brush, you analyze your subject, what color is it, what temperature are the objects and what value do they have? And what's important now, how do you do that? You compare items from the same color family with each other. You compare red with red, blue with blue, green with green, yellow with yellow, and, and so on. You look at the value, but what value is it? Is it darker or lighter by squinting your eyes? You look at subjects with a straight head, looking, not moving from left to right, looking over this here and looking over this. No, you look and see in your eyes, ah, this is a darker one and this is a lighter one. Especially, some, the main problem is not the color. Everybody sees this is blue, this is red, this is whatever, you know. The problem starts with the temperature. How do you figure out if this red is warmer or the other one? By comparing, you have to compare them and then you see clearly, oh, this tomato is a warmer red than the tablecloth or whatever, you know? And uh, this is how you analyze your subject. And the big advantage is this analysis creates a kind of roadmap in your head, a concept. So you know, before you grab a brush, the main things in my painting is this shape, is this shape, is this shape, and that's how I have to bring them together. So this is what you need to know about, you know, which is so important that you do this anal analysis before you grab a brush, and then that helps you to paint much faster. That's a big advantage of that. Usually I see students, you know, they do five brush strokes, then they scratch their head for five minutes thinking what should be my next brush stroke, you know, and so on. They haven't done an analysis. That's, a, that's the problem. But if you learn how to do that, then you go to your, painting and you start right away and you punch it up and you go fast and you end up within about one hour, 30 minutes to two hours with a 24 by 30 size. Imagine that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I tell you, since I'm doing this analysis stuff, I don't care about the sun. I want to beat the sun. I want to win the race against the sun. The sun is moving. The sun is not waiting till I have done my decisions. So I make my analysis and I put in the basic information in my painting within the first 20 to 30 minutes. And now I have everything what I need to know. And the sun can do whatever it likes. It can go or it can hide behind a cloud or whatever. I don't care anymore. So what you're but, doing is, uh, just to, for clarity purposes, you're fixing the light. You're going to say, all right, I'm committing to the light where it is right now when I'm painting it. If it changes later, I'm not changing it. Is that correct? That's totally correct. You cannot start, let me say, uh, painting a sunrise and you follow the sun. If you do that, then you still are there when the sun sets. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know? yeah. So I know exactly after 30 minutes, I have the main information on my canvas, which I need. 
And from that point on, I don't really need the sun anymore. That's what I said, because I can finish this painting with this main information which are there. The details, they will still be there in the landscape. They don't go away, you know, trees and whatever, houses, and I don't know what, you know what's there, or cows or whatever you see there. The only thing what is going to fade away is, is, is uh, the sunlight. But it doesn't matter because I have my basic information on my canvas already and just need to follow that. And that's about it, you know. And some stuff you can even do out of your memory because you know exactly what well, this is my focus area in the painting. And here I will have the strongest light, even the sun is gone, doesn't matter, you know. So this is what I try to, to uh, uh, teach my students too, that they will end up in a kind of shorter time, instead of painting hours and hours and hours on one painting, that they are finished within about two to three hours maximum with the painting. And I'm ending up, as I told you, if you look at my paintings, and uh, I, most of them are done within one hour 30 to one hour 45 minutes. That's a, yeah, that's and you're a painting problem. big. So yeah, what, painting. what are you um, are you using a direct painting method? Are you doing you doing a you know thin underpainting? What what's your process look like? First of all, you tone your canvas with any color you like. You can make a decision. You can say, well, I paint a, a, a cool still life today. I make a warm toning or reverse, because the toning color usually looks a little bit through at the finished painting, because not every little uh, piece is covered with, uh, with uh, the uh, paint. So which if you're gonna go out and do a landscape color. painting, so that you, looks tone them, you tone them in advance? Yeah, I, I don't tone it in advance, I tone it five minutes before I start. Okay, so you don't care if it's because dry. For the toning liquid, I use Demar varnish. And Demar varnish will be dry within two, three minutes. And it gives a kind of stickiness to the canvas. That means the paint which you apply now sits much better on top of the canvas instead of getting absorbed by the canvas pores, you know? So that's one of the reasons. So then if this um, uh, canvas is, um, uh, is toned, and it's dry, it has to be completely dry. I make a simple, let me say, more or less outline of the subject which I'm gonna paint. And then I grab a big brush, uh, probably a 12, would be probably a bigger one. And I paint very washy and thin and transparent and abstract. My first step is an abstract step. Block in the color, wet is important, thin, washy, and it might dry quickly. And then you can apply in the second step, which is a modeling step. Now you give roundness to items which have volume, like apple or flowers or whatever, you know. In the second step, you model, you load your brush more and, uh, and put more paint, paint on it, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's uh, your second step. And the third one is then just the finishing one with some accents, some highlight, not much highlights, not much details, some details. Most of the folks, that's what Bongard used to say, hey, it's some funny phrases, you know, he said, well, there are painters, they start their painting with the signature. And then they do the warm, and then they paint the warm hole, and then they paint the apple around. And he said, we do it the other way. We paint first the apple, and then the warm hole, and the warm, and then the signature, you know. That means you need to ignore by this kind of method to paint details for a long, long time because you paint in big shapes. And what you need to do is you count your big shapes when you paint outdoor and landscape, you shouldn't have more than five big shapes, okay. not to get lost in and, detail. And not, e not equally sized. Right. No, just where you, you analyze, you know, you see all the hills over there are this color, the, the, the ocean is this color and the foreground is this color and the sky is this color. You don't end up with much more than, uh, definitely not more than five big shapes. And that helps right away that um, you will not be drawn into details and you save the details to the very end. And then in the end, if you like to, you can paint 5 million details if you think that's necessary. But for a long time, 90%, you work on the big shapes of your painting and the last 10, 15 minutes, you, you punch it up and finish it. Bongard usually said, you can think about details for 25 minutes, but you execute them in five minutes. Ah. That's what he said about that. Yeah. In other words, keep 
Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. That's one of the most important things, uh, difficult things, as you know, too, as a painter. You to keep things simple. That's so, so difficult because we all have the tendency to get drawn into details way too soon, you know, and this yeah. needs to be overcome. And so, then your painting um, has power. In the, end. The, the, the Russian method tends, if you follow a uh, rep and, you know, you're, those those paintings probably weigh fifty pounds. You know, there's so so much thick paint on them. Is that what Sergey taught you to use a lot of thick paint? Uh, you do the thin wash first, yeah. and then thick on top of it. You did a thin wash first, the abstract step, very washy. I told, I always tell the color might even drip, so washy you do that. And I tell my students, you paint that almost like a watercolor. It doesn't matter if the color, uh, it's a yeah. it's a paint drips. Uh, because of so much liquid which you which you use, that's that's totally okay. But then in the second step, when you come to the modeling step, then you paint half pastels. So you have a load, a good load of uh, paint on it, but not full pastels, not too thick. Only when you come to the focus area, there you show all your power and put strong light with a great amount of paint on your brush onto this focus spot. And that pops out then right away. This is, I always said, now he's switching on the light in his painting. He had his last few brush strokes, bam, 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 you know, like that, like hammering. And ah, the whole painting came to life. That's For like Soroya, you know, he's got one streak. He's got a beach scene and it's glowing with light, but he's got one streak where he's just taken, you know, almost pure Indian yellow brightened up, you know, and just all the way down right? the edge of that yeah. figure with one big yeah. stroke and it makes the painting. That makes the painting, you know. And what you need to know is uh, you need to paint in the so-called middle key. You know, high key, low key, middle key. The big advantage of painting in the middle key is if you need something light, you are you pick it up from the high key because you are neighbor of high key. If you need something dark, you can pick it up from low key because you are neighbor from low key too. But now imagine Rembrandt, for example, he painted low key. If he needed light, he would have come from low key up to high key. That's a way to be done. It would not look in his painting. So he got his light stuff from the middle key area. And if some, mm -hmm. somebody is painting high key almost towards white, he cannot have, when, when he needs dark stuff, he cannot have a jump down from high key down to low key. This is just reverse, a too big jump too. It's so too he will get cover. his dark stuff from the middle key. And I say we are painting in the middle key. We are neighbor to high key, neighbor to low key. Can pick whatever we need because we are neighbor. We are not that far away from each other. So when so you're in the middle key, paint. when right. you're in the middle you key, know. is it more like mud? Is there some brilliant color in there, or are you trying to keep it all very tonal? It's kind of brilliant color, but because the middle key has only, let me say, three more or less three different values it's very close together in the value, the whole thing. And in the very end, as I said, you come with the details, you come with the highlight, and you come with the darkest spots, and you come with different kinds of calligraphy strokes and accents, and that's all in the end. In the end, you make you bring your painting alive. When we watched Gonga doing demonstration, he did demonstration, let me say, uh, painting 36 by 40 for about three hours. We looked at it and two hours and 50 minutes, it looked relatively boring, you know? And we looked at each other and said, oh, that's not a big deal. We jumped <laughs> to our canvas then to paint and after five strokes, we were lost right away, you know? But that's what 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 it was, what, he, what his stuff looked like. It was not thrilling for quite a long time till he came to the final step where he really punched it up and switched on the light in his canvas. All right. So if I do a video with you, it's going to be five minutes long. <laughs> do, do the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it will be fun. You know, I hope you do that someday. You know, I'd be honored. So, yeah. um, so people listening to this podcast are at all levels. You have people who are highly experienced and people who are not. And, everybody's looking for ideas and you know we have this tendency in our world to talk about secrets i'm just as guilty as anybody you know and that sometimes gets people's attention but what are the um the things that you 
other than what you've just described that you talk to your students about that you find are really helpful tips uh, that will will help resonate with people and help them become stronger painters? Eric, the problem is in painting, there is no shortcut, you know. You cannot um, go a shorter way to become a good painter than just exercise, exercise, exercise. Sorry about that. Yep. You need sure. to you need to follow in, first of all, you need to make your thoughts about what kind of painting you, you want to do. You need to look around, which are paintings which are um, attracting me. Is this guy doing a workshop, for example? Then you're going to go for that. But you need to stick to one guy which you are convinced about that he gives you the right way and then the right instructions. And then you just have to go for that. If you jump around by going to too many different artists, it doesn't help you, you know? It hurts everybody, you. Everybody gives you some interesting information, but sometimes they are contrary to each other. The guy, one guy say like this, and the other guy say, no, the opposite is right. So what, what are you doing, you know? You need to well, find I, that I guy. That. Pardon? I said, I get that. And, and you know, I had that disease because I uh, we yeah. shoot all these videos and I go right. in and I watch the shoots. It doesn't help and, you, you know, to find your own way. My, I'd be changing things all the time. And I, I finally studied yeah. with Joe McGurl and he said, listen, you need to just all stabilize. Pick something, whether it's my style or somebody else's style, just stabilize and stick with it for a while. Don't keep changing your colors. And and I did that and it it really had a, had a big impact. You know, and I, I love to go to different people's workshops and learn new things, and I still do. But I do think that that tends to be a little bit of a disease because then you you just kind of like you're bouncing all over the table. That's it. You paint for a couple of weeks like this guy taught you. Then uh, half a year later, you was at somebody else, and you paint like this. And, and where are you then? You you don't find your own your own way, you know. And this and how is also do you something find your own way. Yeah, that's that's exactly the. First of all, you find your own style by not thinking about style. It doesn't make any sense. You know exactly how little boys and girls in elementary school, when they start to write, each one looks like the other one. There's no individual differences. But as soon as this folks has grown up, if you get today a letter, you see already the way the address is written, oh, this comes from my daughter, or this comes from my son, or who from ever, because they have developed this writing style. And that's exactly the same in painting. But you need to ex you need to work, you need to paint, otherwise no style is coming along, you know? And uh, sometimes I have students and, and they come in and say, oh, I'm, I'm happy about that, now I'm gonna get a new style, you know? And I wonder, I thought, gosh, God, what are they expecting? The, I mean, Walmart where they can buy a new blouse, you know, they need to work when they want to have a new style. What happened to me, Eric, was this. I was painting very lousy for many years. And uh, sometimes I was ready to throw my brushes either in our lake, which uh, where I live, or, or hang myself in the bathroom or whatever, you know. And uh, But then someday, after many years of frustration, I was looking at the paintings which I have done the last five, six months. And I saw, wow, something has happened. It looks more and more like this is done by one guy who has a, a, a signature, a handwriting now, his own style. And I was so happy about that. I almost went with a tie around my neck into bed the next evening, you know, because <laughs> this was a great, a great moment. But I had this after years of frustration, I must admit, you know. And I'm surely not that super genius painter or talent which fall down from the sky as a great master already. I needed to work very hard. And sometimes I thought, are you too stupid to get that? Try that again. And I came home, I tried and disappointing. I said, okay, next day again. And this was going for several years, you know, till I really came to a point where I said, no, I'm quite uh, okay with that, what I'm doing. And still today, I don't talk about uh, paintings which I do that I say, oh, this is a great piece, or this is a, no. I say, well, it's kind of acceptable. That's what I say, because I always <laughs> think it could, it could be better, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like your humility. I think that's important. You know, and, and there's nothing like painting that'll kick your butt just yeah. when you think you're getting good. Right. That's, that's one of the, and it's another thing is you need to, go out you know this landscape here in the united states is so gorgeous 
that you should go outside and paint out and not sitting in a studio, the cat on your lap, you know, the husband on the back gives you a neck rub or something and the music plays and the coffee machine runs and once in a while you do two brush strokes and think you are a great artist. That's not working like that. You have to be more serious. You, 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 need, to, you need to go out and, and study nature. And uh, by the way, nature is, has such a great influence on the way you paint. I always say the lousiest outdoor painting has more true atmosphere and mood than my best indoor painting. And that's one of the reasons why very soon I started to paint landscapes indoor, because this is totally against what the impressionist said and told the world, you know? They said, you need to go out of, the, of, your, of your studio. You need to paint a landscape where the landscape is. You need to be in the landscape. By the way, the critiques, as you surely know, they praised the impressionists and said, how genius they have been that they, they discovered the, the ordinary things just around their house. In the, in the neighbor's garden and so on. Well, I don't know what is genius about that, you know? Uh -huh. You know why they did that, why they discovered that? Because they didn't have a car. They could not drive around to look for subjects. So they, <laughs> they went the easiest way, step out the door, set up your easel and start to paint, you know? <laughs> well, and I think that's a that's a great workshop. I I, um, I I was with Randy Sexton one time at a workshop and and we set up in an alley. And I was like, what? And he said, find beauty, you know, find something here to paint. And, you know, it, it was a, you know, you, usually you're like looking for uh, the Alps or something. And so when you find you, you have to find beauty wherever you are. I think, yeah. you know, we spend hours driving around when it's right next to us. Yeah. That's the point, you know, you need to see beauty just where you are. And uh, you need to forget names, terms, labels, all that stuff, because you see, when people start to paint the Grand Canyon, many are, oh, they shrink down to, to whatever, you know, uh, because it's such a mighty thing. It's such a big name. So that could be a kind of, uh, of uh, stress, you know, to, to end up with a good painting. So find more simple things. Find the beauty in just uh, out of your house, in your garden, or in the neighbor's garden, or near the beach, or wherever you live, you know. That's much better than to hope that you drive out and somewhere something super spectacular jumps voluntarily on your canvas. That is not working that way. You, know? you need to yeah. train your eyes to see the beauty. And out there is so much beauty. And, uh, well, this is what I like to do in America. That's why I love to paint here, you know, much more than, than in Europe. By the way, because also the students are much more pleasant than in Europe. I, I mean... I have my experiences on both sides of the ocean, you know, and uh, American students, they are enthusiastic. They are willing to accept um, certain circumstances. They know they cannot change the elements anyway, you know, so they need to accept the elements. And in Europe, there, it can happen that exaggerated. No, I, I can tell the students, a student one and one is two. And she might say, well, maybe it's five. I need to do research, you know, <laughs> something like that. You know? So I think my lady, shut up and swing a big brush. That's it. You know, don't make it so complicated. Yeah, have and, some fun and don't don't be so precious about it. No, that's right. You know, it's much more simple. Many students are doing it very complicated, you know, because well, they you're, in the, you're in the lineage of Repin because of your teachers and you know, in, in the Russian Academy, plein air painting is a very major part of their academic study. They study, as a matter of fact, the students are required. Uh, they have to spend all summer at one of the locations, usually the academic Adasha in um, uh, Vili Vostok, and they, uh, they have to paint plein air all summer and landscapes, figures outside, and it really is part of what informs them in their painting. And that may be why the Russians just get such brilliance and color. Right. And they live on the countryside. You know, I'm also not a big city person. You know, I like the small towns here in the United States. They are very charming. I'm thinking about places like, let me say, well, maybe a Blanding in southern Utah is a gorgeous place with all the surrounding canyons and stuff or uh, Thermopolis in Wyoming, or Chadron in Nebraska, which is close to my favorite Indian tribes, the Sioux Indians, the Lakota, you know. So uh, this is where I find my subjects out on the, on the countryside. 
And nowadays in our high civilized world, especially in Europe, we are more in danger to lose contact to nature than you are in the United States. You still have wide open, untouched areas. We hardly have that in Europe, you know? Europe is overcrowded. I cannot- Well, and we all want to go to Europe and paint. Isn't that funny? Yeah, you will see. Well, if you are in a big group, it's okay, but I'm by myself. And I tell you yeah. why that's uh, uh, terrible for me. Because when I set up my, my easel at our lake, at the shoreline, I tell you, in two minutes, I have 50 folks around me who tells me all kinds of stories which I don't need to hear, you know? And one of the things is, yeah, my grandpa was a painter too. So yeah. what should yeah, I we all put this up information? With that. It's interesting. I, I use it as an opportunity to tell people about why they should become painters. Uh, so, uh, Guido, this has been absolutely fascinating. We're, we're out of time, but uh, we're going to have you back sometime because we could go on time and time and time again. Uh, you've got a lot of great Thank stories and there's a lot more to learn. Thank you so much for being on the Plein Air podcast today. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Eric. Good luck for your enterprises. Thank you. Yes, and we'll go painting together soon. Okay. All right. Cheers. All right. I, did I, I, I think I said Guido. It's Guido. <laughs> My apologies, Guido. All right. Are you guys ready for some art marketing? Let's do that. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. Our goal is to help you learn to sell your paintings in one form or another. And if you learn marketing, you embrace it, it will help you. We have uh, questions that you send in. Sometimes we record them if we get a chance. Uh, you can send them to eric at artmarketing.com. And uh, we have a great website you can look at too, artmarketing.com, which is a terrific place for uh, lots of stories on how to market your art. Okay, what's our first question, Amandine? The first question is from Joanna Pierman from Glenwood Springs, Colorado. My goal is to be the premier local landscape artist in my Colorado ski town in five years, but my art isn't ready yet. How would you work smarter to improve your art if you knew your art wasn't ready? I also want to use this time to plan, save, and understand marketing so that I'll be ready when the time is right. What should I be doing? Lastly, would selling underbaked art be a bad idea? All right. Well, Joanne, thank you. I love the fact that you have goals. Um, and, and I think it's important to have goals, but you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's potentially a big audacious goal, and I think it's good to have big audacious goals. But if you are not selling your art today and you think that five years from today you're going to be the best artist in your town you better hope the best artist in your town uh, is someone you can easily overcome right i mean there are painters out there who have been painting for 40 or 50 years who are brilliant and brush time does matter experience does matter and and we want everybody i want to encourage you we want everybody to to dig in to study to learn uh and to practice. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of issues here. So I'm going to touch on some of these things, but, uh, first off, you got to do the best thing you can to make yourself as good as you can. And I don't know what that is for you because I don't know where you are, but what I like to do, I, I don't just ask anybody because my mother would tell me how good my paintings were, even when they weren't. And, you know, it's like, no, I need to know what I'm doing wrong. And so you need to get your paintings in front of somebody who will tell you the truth. And you've got to give them permission to tell you the truth. And the, the only way I do that is I say, look, I don't want to hear anything good about it. I just want to hear what's wrong with it. Tell me how to fix it. Tell me what I need to be working on. Because, you know, when I go and study with somebody, oftentimes they'll say, bring a couple of your paintings or some slides of your work or something, some, you know, pictures in your phone because they can instantly see where your weaknesses lie. And, you know, it might be composition, might be values, might be brushwork, might be who knows what. So you need somebody to give you some feedback. So you need a couple of trusted people to give you feedback. And I include in that somebody who would be a gallery owner or two, not to, not to get into their gallery, just be upfront, say, look, I, you know, maybe I'd like to be in here in the future, but right now I just need to know what I need to work on from their perspective. No, their gallery owners aren't painters, but they can see things because they're around art all the time. Um, I think that 
the most important thing for you to do after that is to say, okay, well, what, you know, what's my target look like? If, if your goal really is to be the top painter in your, in your small ski town in five years, you know, where is the bar and what do I have to beat? And who's going to be judging that? How are you going to know when you've accomplished it? And so, you know, I think studying, uh, I don't really think in terms of competition in painters because, you know, I don't look at, my goal isn't to try to beat another painter out. It's, you know, or to be, I just want to be the best I can be. And, you know, I think what you're really saying is I want to make a, a living equal to or better than the best painter in my town. And, and that's a, a handsome goal. So you need to kind of get the details, you know, if, if that's your goal, why is it your goal? Why is it important to you? Uh, and then what are the specifics to that goal? What do I have to do to match it? Well, you know, what kind of sales do I have to do, you know, yearly, monthly, weekly? Uh, and is that really the right goal? I mean, it might be, but, uh, you've got to figure that out. Um, now if you, um, are not ready uh and you know that you're you're on the right track i mean sometimes I, you know i painted for a lot of years and and i still struggle and i know i'm not as far along as i could be if i if i could find the time and you know if you can put in eight ten hours a day just painting it's gonna you know i've watched richard lindenberg who went from a full-time job to a full-time painter two years later by painting eight hours a day he was phenomenal and he just continues to get better and better, you know, and is he at a level of some of his mentors? Uh, he's pushing on it, but he's not there yet. But most of us aren't. Most of us, you know, will never get to those levels because those mentors are always pushing themselves and getting better and better. So, you know, don't, don't compare yourself to other people. I think that's the biggest way to get frustrated. Um, if you're not selling and you want to be selling, I, I will tell you this. Um, there's no second chance to make a first impression. And if you, if somebody perceives you as a bad painter, they're going to hold on to that for a long time. And so before you start putting your work out there, make sure that you're comfortable with it. Make sure others who you trust are comfortable with it because, you know, no, nobody expects you to be John Singer Sargent or Anders Zorn, but they do expect you to have a certain level of quality. Now, different galleries have different levels of quality. Different buyers have different perceptions of quality. So, you know, you can kind of ease your way in, get used to it, get known uh, by some people, develop an audience, and, you know, just continue forward as you grow. But just be ready. That's the best advice for you. In terms of marketing, uh, you know, uh, marketing takes planning. It takes strategy. I think, you know, really... If I were to bring it down to a nutshell, number one, be the best painter you can be. Number two, uh, be the kind of person that people want to help. You know, some people come in and say, I deserve to be in this art gallery. Well, look at you. Uh, and this is not nice. You know, people want to help nice people. So work on that if you're not, um, because you need people to help you out along the way. I wouldn't be where I am and others wouldn't be where they are without the people there helping them. Um, you need people. So start working on relationships. You know, if you, if you target a gallery in five years, uh, start getting to know them, help them out, hang out with them. Uh, but don't ask for anything, just help. You know, I think that matters. And then, uh, what's number three, ultimately it's about visibility. Visibility gives you a critical advantage, be everywhere, network, get involved. Uh, when the time comes, advertise like crazy and never let up. Once you decide to be a professional painter, uh, advertising is a cost of doing business for the rest of your life. Uh, you have to admit that. And, uh, but advertising is almost like cheating. You can't cheat painting because you got to learn it, but you can cheat advertising. I don't mean be dishonest. I mean, the fact is that you can, if you do it right, you have really great creative and you have really great, uh, buying and you spend the right amount of money to hit the right audiences. You know, we, we do very targeted audiences at my magazines, you know, with rich art collectors, for instance, at fine art connoisseurs. So the idea is uh, you gain every advantage from visibility. So you got to enter every show. You got to win as many shows as you can. Even if you win as a finalist in something, you got something to talk about on your website. You got something to talk about to other people. Uh, all that builds up into becoming your brand and who you are. 
getting into the right shows is a big booster. You know, some of the shows that I, one big artist told me he applied nine years in a row to get into a major show and he didn't think he'd ever get in and boom, one time he was in and now he's in forever. Winning top awards is going to build visibility. Uh, you just got to do a lot of different things. Uh, don't focus on tactics, focus on strategy, you know, learn where you want to be, learn what you need to do to get there and then figure out what the steps are. Next question. The next question is from Judy Epp from Canada. When a person says, I can't afford that, when they have expressed interest in a piece, what they are really saying is, I disagree with the value given to it with dollars. How do you make a person understand what those dollars are really paying for in original art? Well, Jody, I think that um, people say a lot of things when they're trying to get out of a purchase. And you may be assuming that they're saying, I disagree with the value given to it in dollars, right? They may not be saying that at all. They might be saying, I just want to get out of here, or I got lunch in, in five minutes. I got to get out of here. You never know. People, people tell you things to get out of purchases. Um, there are little white lies we all tell, you know, like when you're shopping and a salesperson approaches you, can I help you? You say, what? I'm just looking, right? little white lies. And it's just because you don't want to be bugged. You're going to find what you want. And sometimes you're going to ask, sometimes you're not. People have excuses they use, including the excuse of I can't afford it. And um, that's a pretty hard one to come overcome because if you, if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. So that doesn't mean they don't value your work. It means that um, they can't afford it or they're lying to you. So um, you can't necessarily change people's minds. Now, selling begins with the word no, or I'm not interested, uh, because if you push a little further, you might help somebody break through. You can't change their mind, but they can change their mind. So if you ask questions that help them change their mind, that can help. Um, I like to understand, do they really want it? And can they truly not afford it or can they afford it? And so how do you get there? You ask questions. I don't ever want anybody to feel pressured, uh, but you can lead them to a solution that works for them sometimes. I can't afford it might mean I'm looking for a better price, or it might mean I'm just not fully committed yet, or it might mean I need a creative solution like a payment plan or something. So I might say, you know, Mrs. Jones, I hear that a lot. Some people say they can't afford it because they're really looking for a better price. Others say it because they really... Uh, just don't want to say no and don't want to hurt my feelings. Uh, but, you know, either is okay because after all, not everybody's a buyer and, uh, you know, I have thick skin. So which are you? Are you really looking for a better price? You really can't afford it? Or is this just not for you? That sometimes flushes it out. Pause and listen. If they say it's not for them, thank them for being honest. Tell them that you hope they have a great day and that you hope they'll find something eventually. And by the way, um, if you send me your email, I'll put you on my newsletter. And uh, that way, if you, you see something you like, eventually, maybe you'll come back in and get something, you know, just very low key. You know, only 20% of the people are ever ready to buy at that moment. It's that continual exposure and contact that brings them back in eventually. Sometimes that takes years. Sometimes it takes weeks. Sometimes it takes days. And, uh, you know, you can give them a postcard or calendar or something to remember you by if you want to. Uh, if they say, I truly can't afford it, then you could say something like this. I understand that. That's not unusual. I find that sometimes I have to work with people and I do it when I can. Sometimes people just need to put it on their credit card and make payments. That's planting that idea. Sometimes uh, they make payments to me. Sometimes they pick it up once it's paid off, you know, whatever works for you. You know, I'm pretty flexible. If that route doesn't work for you, then simply ask, well, what can we do together to make sure we can hang this in your home tonight? Ask them, you know, uh, where do you think you're going to hang it? Get them envisioning that a little bit and listen, don't talk. And then they might and let them make an offer. And, you know, if, if you're far, far apart, you can say, well, that doesn't work for me, but this works for me. And understand that whatever you say, they're going to come back and come back with half of that. So, you know, I really can't make that price concession. Now, Anytime you do give a price concession, always give an answer, a reason. Because if you just give a price concession, it feels a little dirty sometimes. But if you say like, well, you know, uh, my accountant has told me I can never discount prices. But once in a while, 
I really see somebody that I know they really want it. And I, I just want to help them out a little bit. So he has given me, or she's given me a leeway. I can do it three times a year, but I can only do it three times a year. And, um, I haven't done it this year. I haven't had to, but I'd be willing to do a little bit of a concession if, if that'll help you. And then, you know, maybe pay me in return in the future by buying something else or, you know, whatever. So sometimes little things like that, you know, if the, if the number's too low, say, here's, here's what I can live with. And sometimes you just have to say, I can't take that. I apologize and, and walk away. And you know what? I've walked away from deals thought about them, come back and bought things. I have, sometimes I've thought about them for weeks and come back and bought things. You just never know. So I think it's, um, it's a good idea to just get some practice. Now, some of us just are not good at that. We're uncomfortable with it. So a really good way to do it is if you have a friend, like have them work at your booth at an art show and have your, fr- and you work their booth so that you're talking about them that way, you know, I can't give you a discount because the artist isn't here, but you know, here's what I can do. Here's what I'm allowed to do. They've allotted me 10% or something like that. Anyway, I hope that works for you. That's the Art Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. To seeing you guys at the Plein Air Convention. So excited. If you're not coming, get in the car and come. Plenairconvention.com, right? And uh, looking forward to seeing you guys in the Adirondacks and Fall Color Week. Just go to publishersinvitational.com. And if you want to go to Europe with me and Peter Trippi, and we're going to go see some great art from behind the scenes, go to finearttrip.com. Now, if you've not seen my blog on Sunday, Sunday Coffee, check it out. And you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. And uh, I'm on daily, weekdays on Facebook. Uh, Just go to YouTube and look up Art School Live. I have great teachers teaching daily for free. How's that? All right. Anyway, that's it. Thank you to Guido Frick. He's fascinating. I could talk to him for hours, and I hope to again. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. It's a big, big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.